Today, we're gonna be talking about what is going on with classic games and, and more specifically, preserving classic games. A big new study just dropped yeah. saying that 90% of games are unavailable to play. I think confirms something we were feeling mm -hmm. was happening. And it's interesting to really dig into the conversations around this because on the proof, it seems like a lot of people just don't care. It's like, it is what it is. What are you gonna do? But it's so scary to think about all of these games that are so important to the history of games, to our history as video game players, just being lost forever. And that's a possibility that's really real and, and not great, honestly, so. It is concerning yeah. and we're gonna dig into it from the video game publisher side, the pres preservation side, just from mm -hmm. the fan side. We're gonna really attack this. We're gonna Maybe figure it out. Figure it we're out. We're gonna find the solution. Today, in right this here, podcast. Right now. Here we go. If you want to support us finding the solution to preserving <laughs> video games and classic video games, join us on patreon.com slash Kit and Krista. Everything that we do here is made possible by our lovely, wonderful, beautiful Patreon family, and it's great. Sometimes people say, well, if I sign up for this Patreon, what do I get? Well, let me tell you about something cool that we do every week. It's called the Bonus Q&A. Yes. In this podcast, we do about a half dozen questions for everybody to, to hear and listen to, but we do an exclusive, additional set of Q&A that we post only for our Patreon subscribers yeah. each and every week. Very cool perk. That's one of the many cool perks that we have if you're part of our Patreon community. And each and every one of our questions that we get for this podcast and for the bonus Q&A comes from our Patreon community. So if so you have true. a burning question that you want us to answer, join us on Patreon. That's right. We will answer it yeah. for you. Um, all right. Well, it is the middle of summer now. We are the in- peak summer this tiny room together. We have the air conditioner <laughs> the going. The air conditioning is going. We I'm wearing our... short pants like I'm a lad out of the 1820s. We did learn our lesson from like last summer when we did this. We like try to suffer through like one of the right. heat, the hot days, the heat wave days without air conditioning. We're like, I gotta preserve the purity of the audio. Then we're like, no one wants that. <laughs> no one wants to see this sweaty mess, I mean, they okay? might, they might. Somebody um, out there might. Apologies if you're hearing the air conditioning, but we don't care. Um, I saw our friend Andre Seekers from Game Explained, was, he, he put out a tweet, he's like, I, I can't, I don't know what to do in the summer because I need to record these crisp, clear VOs, but I can't have people hearing this. Andre, yes, you can. Take care of yourself. You should not suffer, Andre. We're yes. not suffering. Um, it is 92 degrees today, which is a little, a little hot. Which, which is not that bad compared to other places in the country, we should say. That's true. Right. There is some major crazy heat waves out there. So if you guys are, hopefully you guys are all finding a place to stay cool. You know, yeah. it's good to just sit in the dark and play a video game as a way to stay cool. So do that. We have some fun summary topics uh, in the podcast. But first of all, I just went on vacation, mm -hmm. came back. Yes. Now you went on vacation, came back. Yeah. Please give us the highlight, and I always like to ask the low light oh, the low of light. your trip. Okay. Well, I did not go on a three-week vacation like you did. I went on a three-day vacation. You did do a very dramatic uh, internet blackout. I did. I... You went to Amish country. Um, <laughs> sounded great. I went to a uh, I went to a convent for three days. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. So I do like, because we are online so much. I think this doesn't bother you as much and? as... It bothers me. And the problem is? Not bothers me, but it just gets a little bit tiring for me, okay. I think. So, I mean, everyone's different. When is it this secretly to... an escape from me? Yes. Exactly. I can't. I can't. You what do I do? Out. You figured it out. You finally figured it out. I've been trying not to tell you to your face, but you finally figured it out. I just wanted to get away from you. It's not. Um, yeah, I just needed like a couple of days. I love going up to, this is like Bay Big Bear Lake area in Southern California, which is quite a bit of a drive from here where we are in San Francisco, but um, really beautiful out there. I go to this place, um, it's called Getaway. They have these little, sort of these little mini cabins. They're all teeny tiny. It's a tiny cabin it's for a tiny, tiny person <laughs> like you. <laughs> it's Sounds a tiny perfect. cabin, but it's nice because it has like everything you need. Yeah. In the little tiny cabin, you have a bed, you have like a little cooking area, and most importantly, what I need when I'm like out in nature is a shower and a toilet. Mm. So it has a shower, so that was very, very nice. This um, is not camping. No. No. It's like such baby camping. It's like not even glam. It's like a camping. It's not camping. It's not even camping. Yeah, it's not it's even not cl remotely close to camping. Um, but it was great to like unplug a little bit, relax. 
Um, I played a ton of games while I was there and just like not, there's no internet up there, like literally nothing. So you're not even tempted to look at your phone, you know? Like, to look well, you, you did find a way to text me a great Final Fantasy spoiler. I did not out of the, text out you of the a spoiler. Out of the blue. Like, th thanks no. for, uh, I'm interrupting my internet blackout to, to spoil no. you on this huge thing. What? So you and I have been talking a lot about Final Fantasy. You just started playing, so you're quite a bit ways before, but, uh, behind me. And you told me this thing that you were like confused about in, yeah. the, in the game story wise. And Don't was, say it again. I'm not gonna say it. Jeez. I'm just saying that when they revealed this part of the story, it was pretty obvious what was happening. But like hours had gone by, you had kept playing without yeah. realizing this has happened. So I had to, well, actually, you from my internet blackout to uh, to tell like you a what true was going like on. a true reply gal. You drove hours to get internet to uh, tell me <laughs> I that I was a to moron. The top of the mountain yeah. just to tell you that you're stupid. Well, actually, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> I would go to no. I would not. I would go to any lengths to make you feel stupid. By the I should way, get you so. a t-shirt, reply gal. Yeah, you that could be a nice look for you. That's yeah. cute. Okay. I like that. I would wear that shirt. Get it for me. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was great. It was nice. I want to know the low light though. You didn't tell me oh, the, the low, low light. light. It was really hot up there. Yeah. Like <laughs> I was actually worried about you. Yeah, it's like it was the hottest day. I think got up to like ninety one. Oh, okay. Up there, that's fine. But um, it, it was like you know, not only is it hot, like in California, is it hot and dry, so it, it's like dusty, oh. and so I, it was like a little bit like everything was staticky. Like when I was like brushing my hair, it was just like dust and static in my hair because it was just so hot. The little tiny cabin, because it's not camping, had AC, <laughs> so it was fine. But I would have loved to have like gone out on like more hikes and stuff, but I, it was too, kind of just too hot. Too hot. Yeah. Last time I went there in November, it was like pretty cold. Like it snows up there. You can ski up there. So it was like too extreme. So one, one of these trips, I will go there when it's like the perfect temperature. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? But it was great. I loved it. Uh, so vacation season is over for us. Yes. No more of those. No. Uh, we ain't going anywhere. We have some... A lot of stuff upcoming. We're, we have a busy second half of the summer. We have a busy second some half. Some of it you can hear about, some of it you can't. Yeah, it's exciting uh, stuff At the though. moment. Uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We Come are, back here. We are recording a very fun Super Kit and Krista 64 video. This is your. This is a big idea from you. I had. I really was proud of myself for coming up with this idea, and I like literally came up with it in the middle of the night. Yeah. It was like two o'clock in the morning. I was like, "This is what we're doing." Um, but. I have been wanting to go back to one of our cooking videos for mm. a while. I just, I like doing those. You know, it was so fun when we did the Splatoon cooking contest. We you played... like losing? No. I don't like losing. And also, not fair that you gave me a live squid to deal with and I gave you like a spam. So calm down. It was an octopus. Calm down, first of all. Iron Chef, Kit, Ellis. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to go back to our cooking video. We are noted fans of, of cooking and food and we've done so many cooking videos across Nintendo Minute and obviously you know our uh, Super Kitten Kiss to 64. So we are going to be recreating food from Super Nintendo World which is going to be really fun. I like this idea for a couple reasons. First of all we so we went Back in when was that April? It was like March. And we had yeah. like we had like literally a perfect day. We but, were lucky. But since then, we have continued to hear from people, friends of ours, who have yeah. gone and have not had a perfect day. No. And a lot of it has to do with this ding dang cafe yeah. that is impossible to get into. Yeah, and so we did a lot of planning beforehand, and what you have to do is to get the early access and literally run. Rush in at 8 a.m. like the crack of dawn right. to get a reservation at this toad. It shouldn't cafe. be like that though. It really shouldn't, but it's just so tiny and crowded. Yeah. Isn't it? What can you do? Right. I looked recently, like a day or two ago, on the Super Nintendo World website to see if there's even early access passes available. They're sold out for the next like four months. The one, those. the one that we got. Yeah. Mm. So I think the chances of you. Getting into this Toad Cafe. Yeah, I think if you don't have that, you're not getting in. Is near impossible. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of like remedy see, this. there's a lot of research we did, but it's a lot of things that I don't think if you're just a regular person, you should be penalized for not yeah, knowing. It's true. So it's a bummer. So I feel like this is a good deed that we are doing to the world yes. because it's like this food is like 
This is stuff that you can do. Like yeah. you can add the Mario flourishes. It's not that hard. Yeah. So we're doing a Recreate full Recreate this experience three for course you. meal including including one item that was sold out that we yeah, never got. We got we we I'll were make it myself. Ourselves. Yeah. We're we we missed out. We have a little FOMO here. Yeah. So we're going to make our own dessert that we did not get at Super Nintendo World. One of the items is actually only available, I believe, at Super Nintendo World in Osaka. Oh. So if you're not going to Osaka, maybe you can just make it at home. I don't know. Um, so it's gonna be really fun. We have, yeah, like you said, we're gonna do like a full sort of three course meal um, yeah. of items and food from Super Nintendo World. We're gonna see how closely we can replicate everything. We got all, all these really cute little props to make it look and feel very Mario themed. Um, we, I feel like we are pretty, both pretty competent in the kitchen. So I think we can do this. And it's not a competition, so you can't lose. Move Imagine over, that. Chef Toad. Maybe like throw this figure like out the window. See you later. No, we're gonna use that. We need that. We need that as a prop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a captain or a, a Chef Toad montage of him screaming the, at a television well, screen for a minute? That's like, what you. That's what you do. Hi. You're in charge of all the Toad voices Time around to here. Go. <laughs> Whoa. We're gonna cook. <laughs> oh, okay, I need to save my voice for tomorrow. Yikes. Yes. Yes. Great stuff. Um, and as always, our Patreon subscribers will get that first yes. over the weekend. Uh, for everybody else, it will be out uh, probably week? probably mid next week. Mm -hmm. Hint, hint. So yeah, you can look forward to that. Yeah. All right. So we're starting things off. Again, we want to keep the summer vibes going strong in the beginning here. Uh, we're going to start with sort of our, our Patreon question. And we put out this question to our Patreon folks, which was... What are the games that you like to play during the summer or give you those perfect summer vibes? Mm -hmm. We've talked about this last year. We've done Nintendo Minute videos yeah. about this that have since been pulled from the internet for being far too controversial. Oh, so um, controversial. And it's, and it's a topic that we just love to endlessly talk about. Yeah, so we games got some, that we endlessly like to search for right. during the summer to also play. For so we got vibes. some great answers. The first one is, I like to pull the answer that I was looking for. You know? Oh, you do. You're like I'll cherry pick. So, yes, I agree with this. I'm oh, taking this one. So the first is from that. Squid Tech. Some I love playing fraud. Splatoon in the summer. I'm not sure if it's just me, but the game has such a summer vibe. So it true. is not just you, Squid Tech. It it's is all. It's got of us. like a poolside, right. like water gun kind of feeling. Right. So definitely a summer vibe game. Like if they ever release a Splatoon game in like February, I might not play it. No, why would you do that? I That's might. Dumb. I might just boycott it out of, out of principle. Oh. You can't put out a Splatoon game in, in winter. And they did, they just did the like the ice cream flavors yeah. splat fest, which right. is perfect for the summer right. as well. So they know, they know. Okay, they know what they're doing. Good, good for them. Uh, next one gets deep into nostalgia from why you Wahoo. I have such a hard time saying that every time. <laughs> it started when I was in school, but every summer I make an effort to play through one of the old Pokemon games from oh. the GBA or DS days. This year it's Black 2, White 2. Something about handheld form factor screams summer to me, even if the game isn't usually summer vibes. Maybe it's how I used to take my DS out places as a kid. Even on vacations, I would just play Pokemon on the beach and make my family mad for being antisocial. Road trips. <laughs> yes, Summer perfect. road trips. I remember doing this too, you know, playing a Game Boy in the car or on a, you know, on a camping trip or something with my family. So I totally, I totally agree with this. You know what you could do is oh. play um, uh, Alolan Region. What's that called? Oh, yeah. Sun and Moon. Sun and Moon, yeah. Um, because that one is very tropical in summary. So that's a that's another add to the list So from here. the GBA or DS days, though. Oh. doesn't fit. It's still handheld. Maybe in a couple more years when that handheld. becomes more retro. Uh, Sharif Jackson, here I go again, cherry-picking these, these answers. Ah. Summer makes me think of games with groups of friends hanging out in a town, park, or secluded area. Yeah. My list includes Firewatch, Oxenfree, perfect. and Life is Strange. Oh, all of these are perfect summer games. Well, you played Life is Strange. Would you say that that's a good pick? I think that's a good, that's a great pick. Really? Yeah, because it does. It has like oh. this like sort of you're at a, in a small town somewhere yeah. in nature. You're either, you know, meeting new friends or, or reuniting with groups of friends. You can kind of have that little nostalgia angle as well. And yeah, definitely. I think, and Firewatch has been our, our list Firewatch forever. Firewatch is, is way up there. Yeah, way um, up there. This last response was one that a lot of people sent in. I, I chose Medallion's response. Star Fox 64 for some reason. I have vivid memories in the summer of 97 playing Star Fox 64 and blasting some music oh, from them. Yeah. And it just makes me feel this is summer good times. I love this. Just yeah, so many people had that. Pumping the Stone Temple Pilots and just... <laughs> 
just 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 getting Going down for it. Yeah. You got MTV. <laughs> got that rumble MTV pack blasting the, away. In the background, yeah. rumble pack. You got you got all the summer. I'm vibes alive. <laughs> <laughs> just scream that. Me. <laughs> summer '97. You got like a cut off T-shirt. Okay, yes. anyways. Great. Uh, so so Firewatch is definitely on our list. Um, short hike. Mm. I think Lil Gator Games getting inducted. Yeah, Dordong is going to get inducted. If you can finish it. If I can finish it. I haven't had some problems. <laughs> you hit a bug, oh no. I need you to look at it. We'll talk about this. that later. <laughs> I need you to look at it for me. I brought yeah. it with me. Oh no. But yeah, there's so many of these great games to play All right. in the summer. Um, I love it. We have another great summer story in our story time about mm. a time where my day was nearly ruined. Wow. Nearly ruined. Um, and we'll talk about it in a moment, but first we got to shout out our sponsor. This episode's sponsored by BetterHelp. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, a lot of times in life, you're going to feel uncertain about what the right path ahead is. I was actually chatting this morning, I haven't told you this, with um, former Nintendo intern Sarah, who's a wonderful oh, person. I and um, she has since started her own startup and That's was talking right. about, gosh, you know, I've had, a, I've had a really challenging year because when you're doing that, you just don't know what the right decision is. Like, well, we can relate to that. Yeah. And, you know, she has surrounded by a lot of great people who can help her make those decisions. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you aren't and you need to talk to somebody. That's right. And that's where a BetterHelp licensed therapist can really help you kind of dissect all of the, the jumble of thoughts that are in your head when you are going through a time of your life like this. We went through we and did. are still going through it in moments. Um, that exact thing, you know, and, and having someone that can help you, whether you're dealing with your career decisions or relationships or anything else, um, is, is so valuable and it's such an easy way for you to get that support that you need. That's right, BetterHelp is great. It's entirely online. You can meet with your therapist through video, through audio, through chat. And the way you get set up is you do a brief uh, questionnaire so BetterHelp knows exactly what you're looking for and you get matched up right away. Yeah, it's awesome. You can switch therapists as well really easily. And it's great to just you know have all the different ways to communicate with your therapist. Um, I find that to be really helpful. Yes. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Kit and Krista today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Kit and Krista. We'll put the link right over here and also in the description below. All right. Story time Time today. for the story time. So we picked this story. I, I, last week we said we we're going to tell a story about me throwing up. Um, which we're going to do next week now. <laughs> okay, you're but still going to throw up, but next week. I got to I got to really build up the anticipation for me vomiting. Um, <laughs> but we had to pick this other one because we realized it's Comic Con this week, and we yes. have a great Comic Con story. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, and Comic Con used to be sort of the height of summer yes. for us, and it was always like something that we really look forward to. It kind of marked like in the opposite of E3, where E3 was so stressful and so such hard work. Comic-Con was like almost like a vacation, even though we it was, were It was like a reward, basically. It was totally a reward, right. and we really saw it as a way to enjoy um, seeing people's reactions to all the games that were announced at E3 that were brought, and, and um, you know, people were able to play it at Comic-Con. And yeah, did, San Diego just has like a summer yes. vibe, for sure. It's so relaxed, like, the, the, the people that were going to this were, were the people who were doing the work. There was no like big boss breathing down your neck. So mm -hmm. there was like all, all the stress that E3 has like was not there yeah. at Comic-Con. It's exactly. very low key. It's yeah. like, yeah, we're just going to do our thing. And you're in beautiful San Diego. I was going to say, San, the, the, just the location you're on itself. the water. Yeah. You stayed at this great hotel that felt like you were at some resort. It's it was like, very nice. This is incredible. One year, producers Effie and I were in the suites. We would um, have a suite for media interviews, but the suite obviously had like rooms attached to Oh, right, to you it. shared the suite with her, right? And so we were basically, like, I was in one of the rooms and she was in the other room. We shared, like, the little middle living room area yeah. and we literally felt like we were, it was like the <laughs> real world. We were like, this is the best day and this is the best work trip ever. Right. We, like, shouted out the balconies. It was great. Those were the days. Yeah, and it's fun to be around, like, like-minded people and you do get, like, it's like, these are all things that we like, you know, yeah. like, comics and games mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff that's sort of around yeah. that. So it's just super fun to be there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's like, yeah, you want you want equal parts, like, work, but equal parts just yeah. kind of, like, hanging out and, yeah. and you know, reflecting and relaxing. Mm -hmm. So this was 2017 Comic-Con. Um, I remember there was an afternoon where, you know, we were kind of wrapping up our work for the day 
and the conversation with our group had started to turn to like, oh, we're we going to do this afternoon. We're we going to do this evening. And I think it was like, well, you know, let's, let's, the, this hotel that we're at, let's get a great pool with a bar next. Let's get, grab some drinks by the pool and yeah, hang out. And yeah. then, you know, go on the town, get some nice dinner, hang out, ch- talk. It's like, well, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but then I get a phone call. Oh, boy. And the phone call is from our head of corporate communications, mm-hmm. who's not at Comic-Con. No. But got a hot tip about something happening at Comic-Con. And he says... Uh, so the ESA, the Entertainment Software oh, the Association, ESA. is at Comic Con, which was news to me. Oh, uh, he said they're they're do, they have a big event that they're doing off site, and they're doing this big live stream later today, and they're going to have the head of the ESA and some Congress people who are representing San Diego on the live stream, and the game they're going to play is Mario Kart Eight Deluxe. And they want someone from Nintendo to be on the stream to just, you know, represent that that part of it. And we've already talked about it back at headquarters, and you're the guy who's going to do it. <laughs> so weird. And my heart just drops. Your heart sinks. Yeah. And it's like one of the, again, just as we were setting this up, Comic-Con is like the opposite of E3. Right. This sort of stuff is usually not yeah. at Comic-Con. So it, getting that, like, almost like PTSD... While you're in a place and in the mindset of Comic Con right. that like E3 is rearing its ugly head again with this whole ESA thing, just like it cannot twist you up more I know. on the inside. It's like it's like a dagger through the heart, pretty much. And I remember I talked to you, and your response to these sorts of things is just don't do it. That's exactly what <laughs> I said. I was like, what why? Like, what do you mean? Don't just do it. Like, I'm sure, like, not available. I'm sure there was some conversation with like Reggie or somebody else. Don't was like, yeah, he's gonna do it. Have him Reggie? do it. Reggie. <laughs> He would never have put throwing you under the bus like that. Well, he doesn't know. Send someone else. Anyone else. Who cares? Can p- go and play Mario Kart. Like anyone. There are so many. There are so many people from a Nintendo there that it was not you. Well, there was no time to debate this because it was like this starting in like two hours. So get out there and, and do it. So it was like, it's like I, I'm not one to pout. I really did start to pout in this case. You seem like, really upset. Stinks! You guys are gonna go hang out and have fun. I gotta go to the <laughs> stupid ESA with some stupid Mario Kart with some dumb congressmen. Oh so, no, the congressmen! It's gonna suck. I hate it. Not gonna vote for them. <laughs> and so, but it's like, yeah, there's nothing I can do. How so, far away was it from? It was a good. I'm like, it was like an Uber. Minutes. Uber. No, it's oh. like it's like 15 minute. Okay, but so you had Uber to get drive. in the car and. Oh yeah, it was not like down the street or something. So I was like, all right, fine. And I'm kind of like looking at the clock. I'm like, well, maybe if everything goes according to plan, I can get back by the time you all are heading out. Yeah, it was so like, it was like four ish <laughs> yeah, when you like this, left. Yeah, it's like, this. and we were like, no, well, we felt bad for you because you were like the like the lamb to slaughter, basically. And we were basically like, well, go and then we'll like meet you like by the pool, or like we'll tell you where we are. We end up and you can meet us there whenever you're done. Yeah, so I head out there, and already it's bad. Like, they have some events, like, it's fine. But it's like, oh, the Congress people are doing something. Like, they're running late. Like, you don't want to wait here. I'm running, I'm already getting screwed over here, man. It's like, I don't want to do this. I think I have a lot of text messages from you that was like, total, stupid, I Total hate whiny, this. whiny yeah, text messages. Yeah, they're late. Yeah. I'm waiting here. I like, and I'm like so, I, just, I just, like, sat in the couch, like, mm. <laughs> just gave like a stink face for Pouting. 30 minutes or something. Eventually, like, all right, let's get this stream set up. And it's fine. And so it's the, again, it's the head of the ESA. His name is Mike Gallagher. He's no longer there. But he's just like, you know, Mr. Business. Yeah. And then these two Congress people. They're kind of clueless. Who, it's like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, like, you... they, like they would be like your dad's friends, you know? Like, yeah. Oh, God. Your dad's friends from work or something? Oh, like, my hey, God. hey, buddy. Hey, hey guy. Hey, look, hey. Hey, tiger. Hey, yeah, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Slogger. And they were like, oh, you're, oh yeah, we have a great interest in the, the video game industry. We're representing the interests of the of the video game uh-huh. developers in our region. Vote, sure. vote for me. Yeah, vote uh, for me. That kind of stuff. Yeah. And like, we do the stream place. I was like, they're terrible. They don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I did watch um, this. So you watched it. So this was called Gov Games, which is an important detail. And it's on. Facebook. And I, I do appreciate that you um, were watching the stream. So what was your experience My of watching this? My experience was that this is extremely stupid and awkward. <laughs> and it was the, okay, the way that they set it up, I would never forget this, which was like, 
<laughs> just bizarre. Like usually when you do like a gameplay stream or you're just playing like a let's play, everyone's like seated on the couch yeah. or you're just chilling. You you know you're very relaxed. But like they had these like this weird setup where like the Congress people are sort of in the front on these like stools and they had you like standing, I was, like, standing behind in the back them. or something. Because who cares about me? I'm just there to play this then game. Why did you have to go? <sighs> um. Let me tell you the viewership numbers for this stream, okay? As, as I, I was but, one. But mentally guess how many people you think yeah, were you, watching. Okay, this. I'm gonna pause for two seconds. Yeah. You got y'all mentally guess what you think the live stream numbers were. Now remember, I was watching, so I was one of the people. Okay, here we go. The number is three. Okay, so me. One was you. And no, two other people. Two was probably the guy who told me to do this. Yeah, and then one was like somebody else. I don't know. How much do you? You put a link here for this. Well, so so I found. So I was trying to find the archive of the stream yeah. just to like jog my memory. I couldn't find that. Okay, I did find that. these pictures from this politician's Facebook page. Oh my god! How creepy and weird. Um, this is the only record that I found of this okay. that exists. I'm glad something exists, that it wasn't just me like having a fever dream. <laughs> no, I was there. Um, I, was, I, was, I saw you there. But yeah, so the stream was, was, the stream was laying. The stream was terrible. Um, immediately when it stopped, I got in the car and came back. And I, I did. You made it. I was able to meet up with you guys before you head out. But that was valuable, fun time that I'll never Could get Could have been that. in the pool. Gone forever. But instead, you had to go do a stream for three yeah. people and- the This is why E3 center. failed. This is the ESA at work. I'm telling you, God. when they rear their ugly head during fun times, you know that your life is <laughs> over, okay? So this is a great example of that. Yeah. You were very upset. <laughs> um, we, we remedied that with a delicious pina colada by the pool. So there we go. But- um. I, th I felt for you. Yeah. I felt I made fun of you, but I felt for you. That's the story. So we're not going to Comic Con this year. Uh, yeah. Next year, I think we're going to try and make up some reason to go. Because it's like this year, it's like yeah, we don't really have a reason to go. And there's also this yeah. big strike happening. So it's like, what is Comic Con going to be like this year? Yeah, the strike um, is might be a bit more low key. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but we'd love to go back. Yeah, I really loved when we did our meetups at Comic Con. We got a yes, to we did so much so fun stuff. That was where we first met Captain Alex, who made the Kit yes, and Krista controller. Yes, and now look at Captain Alex, an right. integral part of the Kit and Krista community. That's and right. And that was a connection made at Comic Con. So um, maybe one day we'll be back, but uh, definitely you will never be going on Gov Games ever again. If they ask you to go on again, this time you can say no. I'm not available. Not available. Um, 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 let's move on to our Never a Minute segment. So so we just mentioned the big strike. One of the reasons these people are striking is because of uh, AI concerns around artificial intelligence. Yeah. Well, guess what? For this segment, we are turning the show over back to artificial intelligence yes. because you all demanded it. Soon, your face will be scanned. And we'll be able to use it right. in perpetuity forever, forever without right. any additional payment to exactly. you. Exactly. Soon, your face, though. Will what, be what, a, what a boon to you that will be. Your face will be scanned and it will be scanned forever. We did this once before. You all seem to love it. We have one, two, three, four, five topics that we're okay. going to spit into chat GPT to ask it to write segments for, yes. for us, for the podcast that we're just going to read as is. Yeah. Um, Last time when you asked it questions past a certain date point, it, doesn't, it didn't it have doesn't the know. data. So I think so the, this I time think, we, we rewrote the the questions in a way where we think it will yeah. like make something I up. I think basically. these are all going to be okay. Yeah. Um, so we got five. We'll see how many we get through. The first one is write a Kit and Krista's podcast segment where they explain how they met at Nintendo. So here we go. I'm going to put this And then in we're going to read it verbatim. To the machine. The machine. <laughs> it's thinking. Here we go. Opening theme music. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the what the Nintendo Power Up podcast. That's not what it's called. Oh. I'm Kit, and joining me as always is the amazing Krista. Thanks, Kit. It's great to be here today. We thought it would be fun to share with you, uh, share with you all a story of how we met at Nintendo. It's a tale filled with gaming, laughter, and of course, a touch of Nintendo magic. Oh, absolutely. So let's rewind the clock back a few years. It was E320X. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to steal that chat, GPT. And I was lucky enough to be attending the event as a journalist, oh. covering the exciting Nintendo announcements. At the time, I was just a huge fan of gaming, and Nintendo in particular. And little did Kit know, hit, oh, 
Little did Kit know, but fate had something special in store for both of us. I was actually working at Nintendo's E3 booth that year, engaging with fans and showcasing some of the upcoming games. It was a dream come true for me, as I've always been passionate about gaming and Nintendo. So there I was, roaming the show floor, eager to try out the latest Nintendo titles. I stumbled upon Nintendo's booth, and that's where our paths crossed for the first time. I remember being captivated okay. by Krista's enthusiasm and knowledge about the games. And I couldn't help but notice Kit's excitement and genuine love for Nintendo. We struck up a conversation about our favorite games, our most memorable gaming moments, and even shared a good-natured banter oh. about how we could win a Mario Kart race. Haha, <laughs> yes! That <laughs> Mario Kart debate definitely sparked a connection between us. We ended up spending the rest of the day exploring the show floor together, laughing, talking, and bonding over our shared love of gaming. It was such a serendipitous encounter. Little did we know that our friendship was just the beginning of an incredible journey. A few weeks later, I received an email from Nintendo expressing interest in having me join the, their team. And guess who was already there? Kit! That's right. I was already working at Nintendo as a community Wait, this, this doesn't make sense now. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're about to have to cut bait on this. And but so, I thought I was working at Nintendo. Yeah, this, you were a journalist. Chat GPT, get your stuff together. Uh, you're going to write the next Star Wars movie? I don't think so. Um, all right, we're stopping this one. Oh. If it falls apart, we just we just move on. It fell apart. It was okay in the beginning, but it really did fall. The, there was some plot holes there. Don't call it the Nintendo Power Up Podcast, please. <laughs> uh, next, <clears throat> write a Kit and Krista podcast segment where they announce the cast and story for a Legend oh. of Zelda movie. This is going to be fun. Let's see what we get. Timothy Chalamet for all roles. It better not be. <laughs> I need Chat GPT to try a little bit harder. Uh, here we go. It's faster. Opening now. theme music. Da -da -da. Hey, Nintendo fans. Welcome back to the Nintendo Power Podcast. Stop calling it that. I'm Kit, and joining me as always is the incredible Krista. Thank you, Kit. We have something truly exciting to share with all of you today. We just received some exclusive information about a project that's been on every Nintendo fan's wish list for years. Get ready, because the news about The Legend of Zelda... Movie. Oh, I'm getting kind of excited, actually. That's right, folks. After years of speculation and anticipation, it's finally happening. Nintendo, in collaboration with a renowned film studio, has greenlit a oh, live-action okay. adaptation of The Legend of Zelda. And we have some juicy details to share with you. Let's start with the most important part, the cast. We can confirm that the role of Link will be portrayed by the talented young actor... Insert actor what? name. It's just a fill in the blank? Insert actor name? That's not what I came for, chat GPT. He has proven his acting chops in previous films and has the charisma and physicality to bring the oh. hero. Physicality, huh? All with names. And joining blank as the fierce and wise Princess Zelda will be the incredible blank. <laughs> her performances in fantasy films have showcased her range and ability to embody strong, complex characters. We can't wait to see her take on the iconic princess. But wait, I'm, cu I'm cutting this one off. Wait, this ask it, ask it, what? fill in the names of the actors. Oh. And see if we'll do I it. I can't do that. Uh, let's see. Uh, la, la, la. Oh, Timothy Chalamet! Yes, baby! Okay, what about that? Oh, Anya Taylor Joy as okay. Zelda? Oh, because she's already a princess in the Mario game. Right, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, so. Wait, right here, right here, right here. But wait, there's more. The villainous Ganondorf will be betrayed by the brilliant Idris Elba, known for his commanding presence on stay, stay, uh, oh, I'm sorry, on screen. He has the gravitas oh. and intensity to make Ganondorf truly a formidable adversary. Absolutely, Krista. And let's not forget about the rest of the supporting cast. We have Tilda Swinton stepping in as the role of the wise oh. sage Impa. Tom Holland as the mischievous <laughs> <Lovable Jacob. laughs> The casting choices oh for this movie God. are truly exciting and promise to bring the beloved characters of The Legend of Zelda to life in a new and captivating way. Wow. Am I, keep, am I still going? Well, well let's, let's get the story real fast. Okay. Now into the story. The film will take, the, uh, will take inspiration from the rich lore of The Legend of Zelda series, exploring the timeless battle between good and evil, the quest for the Triforce, and the journey of our hero Link as he sets out to save Hyrule from darkness. Shocking. Um, That's good that they filled in the, the <laughs> actors. I like that. Timothy Chalamet as Tingle. Wow. No, as Link. Excuse me, as Link. But Tom Holland as Tingle. As Tingle. Wow, That's... that is a casting twist that I was not expecting. <laughs> wow. 
All right, next, Write a Kit and Krista podcast segment talking about new Nintendo slogans in the spirit of surprise and delight and smiles on faces. <laughs> Get ready to puke. <clears throat> Here we go. Opening theme music, da da da. Welcome back, Nintendo fans, to another exciting episode of the Nintendo Power Up Podcast. I'm Kit, and as always, I'm joined by the fabulous Krista. Thanks, Kit. Today we want to dive into a topic that always brings a smile to our faces, <laughs> Nintendo slogans. <laughs> Over the years, Nintendo has come up with some iconic catchphrases that perfectly captures the spirit of their games and the joy that they bring to players. That's right, Krista. From now you're playing with power to experience a new way to play, Nintendo slogans have become part of gaming culture. But we thought it would be fun to brainstorm some new slogans, slogans that encapsulate the essence of Nintendo's surprise and delight and smiles they put on faces. Absolutely, Kit. So let's get our creative hats on and start brainstorming. How about unleash the joy, unveil the adventure? It conveys the excitement of Nintendo's games and the sense of discovery that voids players. I love it, Krista. And building on that idea, how about unlock your imagination, unlock Nintendo? It speaks to the limitless creativity found in Nintendo's games and the endless possibilities players can explore. <laughs> the next one is amazing. Ooh, I like that one. Kid, it captures the essence of what makes Nintendo games so special. Here's another one. Gaming bliss. Nintendo's kiss. What? You can't say that. Finish it. Finish it. <laughs> <laughs> about the pure joy and happiness that Nintendo games bring. <laughs> like a kiss from a beloved character? Wow, we got the 18 and up version of oh, ChatGPT. I'm GPT. crying, that's good. That's a delightful one, Krista. And how about this? Enter the Nintendo dimension where fun comes to life. It reflects the idea that Nintendo games transport players to unique worlds filled with fun and excitement. I'm loving these, Kit. Here's another suggestion. Nintendo magic elevating the game. It emphasizes the enchantment and the innovation that Nintendo consistently brings to the gaming industry, raising the bar for everyone else. All right, I've seen enough. Uh, gaming bliss, Nintendo's Nintendo kiss. advertising. That is furiously the Furiously taking notes right this now. This is the one. That's the one. Nintendo's kiss. Gaming bliss. Well, I, I mean, we've had Sonic <laughs> kissing a girl, and now, now Nintendo, now, now Mario's going to be kissing. I don't want to know why. The fans. He's going to kiss you. It's a contest. Win the contest. We get oh, ki like kissing booth. To be Mario's first kiss. Oh. Wow. She, he gets kissed on the cheek by Princess Peach sometimes. Next question. <laughs> right? A Kit and Krista podcast segment where they talk about Nintendo marketing plans for the next oh major gosh. hardware from Nintendo after Nintendo Switch. This is juicy. I'm legit crying from the Nintendo <laughs> kiss. That was really good. Here we go. Opening theme music. Hey there, Nintendo fans. Welcome back to the Nintendo Power Up podcast. I'm Kit, and as always, I'm joined by the fantastic Krista. Thanks, Kit. Today we have an incredibly exciting topic to discuss. We're going to delve into the realm of Nintendo's marketing plans for the next major hardware release after the Nintendo Switch. Get ready for some juicy details. That's right, Krista. While we don't have specifics about the new console just yet, we can certainly speculate on the marketing strategies Nintendo might employ to build anticipation and create buzz among fans. Absolutely, Kit. One thing we can expect is strong emphasis on showcasing the unique features and innovation of the new hardware. Nintendo has always excelled at delivering groundbreaking experiences, and they'll want to highlight what sets their new console apart from the competition. Definitely, Krista, and I believe we'll see a continuation of Nintendo's successful approach of connecting with players on an emotional level. They've always excelled at tapping into nostalgia and creating a sense of joy and wonder. So expect heartwarming commercials that resonate with fans of all ages. I completely agree, Kit. Nintendo has a knack for storytelling. We can expect captivating narratives that highlight the new console's potential for sharing shared experiences and family- I'm pulling the plug on this one. This one stinks. It's really boring. This is not good at all. Come it's on. really boring. ChatGPT, I think, has a low impression of us. If this is the swill that it's spitting out <laughs> at us. Last one. Write a Kit and Krista podcast segment where they introduce three new power-ups oh. that could be in Super Mario Wonder. Now, this, kind of, this could mess it up because it might be like, what's Super Mario Wonder? It is a no. Let's yeah. see. But I know about power-ups in Super we'll Mario. Da, da, da. Hey there, Nintendo fans. Welcome back to the Nintendo Power Up Podcast. I'm Kit, and joining me as always is the fantastic Krista. Thanks, Kit. Today we're diving into the world of Super Mario Wonder, a hypothetical <laughs> oh, new it's Mario real. game that we've cooked up within <laughs> our imagination. No, hold on. The game is real. 
What's it gonna do? I don't think it likes that. No, you need to click the button. I did. You did not. Oh. Okay, here we go. Yes. Oh, it's still. High the hypothetical game is actually real. Okay, great. Okay, good. Here we go. You heard it here first, folks. Super Mario Wonder is not just a product of our imagination. <laughs> Nintendo has been hard at work creating a brand new Mario adventure. Oh, good. That will take players on an extraordinary journey through wonder-filled worlds. This is such an incredible dis uh, development kit. We can hardly contain our excitement. Super Mario Wonder pr promises to be a groundbreaking addition to the Mario franchise with innovative gameplay mechanics, stunning visuals, and, of course, three new power-ups. The Breeze Cake. Oh, here we go. Lava boots and time. Oh, up. that's right, Chris. The players will get to experience the thrill of soaring through the skies with a breeze cape, bravely traversing treacherous lava with the lava boots, and mastering time itself with the time orb. These power ups will add a whole new layer of excitement and challenge to the game. Let's not forget the incredible level design and imaginative worlds that await us in Super Mario Wonder. Nintendo has pulled out all the stops to create a game that truly lives up to its name, immersing players in a sense of awe and amazement with every step. That's it. Boring. Not Elephant Mario? I feel like these responses were worse than last time. But Nintendo's Kiss. <laughs> I mean that that's, that was that made up for it. That's that marketing and, gold, right? That there. and Tom Holland as Tingle has saved the segment. Uh, we need your uh, Tom Holland Tingle photoshops immediately. Maybe Tom Holland would kiss you. Hey, if he's Tingle, he's part of Nintendo, <clears throat> and then he would just kiss say, you. Just saying, that could it's all, be it. It's all possible. Everything is possible with the power of AI. Uh, okay. Uh, interesting stuff. Um, AI maybe not all the way there yet. <laughs> Good for some laughs though. Oh my god. We're moving on to the games we are playing. You have added a few uh, last second editions I have. of games that you played while you were off in your tiny cabin, but we are going to get started with Final Fantasy 16. Yes. Which you have not played in a week. I've not played in three days. Fine, I'll start. <laughs> I have played way beyond you, so go ahead. Well, what does that have to do with it? I can still talk about it, is what it has to do with it. <laughs> go ahead. Fine. Start talking. Um. So I will be very vague about the details because yes. this is no definitely spoilers. a spoiler. Unlike you, I will be very careful about not spoiling things. It was obvious. I've sort of hit, well, I, I, so I, I've hit, I've finished kind of a first big chunk of the game, I feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there has been another time skip. Yes. And there has been kind of a shuffling of important characters, yes. some of which Yes, I know have exactly what you're talking about. Perhaps perished. Uh, some of which who have perhaps returned from mysterious circumstances. And I, as Clive, have now assumed a new role in this organization that he is part of. That's right. That's very, very so big, but yes. I did that last night. I kind of played like a bit, like an hour or so after that. So I'm, I'm very curious to see like what this new setting brings mm -hmm. and kind of like what my objectives are from here on out. It did give me a very... I got a pretty complicated, like, here's here's what's happening in the, in the game world. Uh, now that yes. you're five minutes later, which I honestly had a hard time. I was having a hard time following Okay, that. I'm glad it wasn't just me. Yeah, but that, um, you can go back there and get more explanation. And I always. From that of, nice lady? From the nice lady. Okay. And I do pay attention because every time you do kind of start a new part of the mission, she will give you, like, a lay of the land as to, like, why these two territories or, or places my kingdoms might yeah. be fighting and, and what their history is. So I, it's a little hard to follow. It's very complicated, um, but I'm glad it exists because it gives you some context. Yeah. Which I yeah. Like. yeah. Um, you know, now that I play, I don't know what my hour count is. I'm, I'm obviously nowhere near finishing this game, but I'm, I'm deep enough, I think, to say, like, I'm, I'm a bit surprised at how straightforward and you were saying that last this week game too. is. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it really is in the vein of, like, the new God of War or yeah. other games kind of in yeah. that genre. Like, there are side quests, but it's yeah. not, like, super I mean, so does God of in War. your face about right, right. do these, do these, do these. And yeah. it continues to be the case where, like, the environments that you're in, like, sometimes you will get in a sort of a more open area, but it's not, like, it's certainly nowhere 
as big as even some of the areas in God of War, I would say. Yeah. Um, so you're always in a pretty contained place. Yeah, and the game much like follow the path. Like don't, the game, yeah, the game yeah. seems very focused on te on keeping you moving along mm -hmm. that main path. Like honestly, right. I haven't done a lot of side quests. I haven't done any. I don't. Um, the game seems to just have a pretty straightforward like upgrade path for your gear. Like, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of options. It's just like, oh, well, I got the thing to make the next better sword, so I'm going to do that. Yeah. It's not like, oh, yeah. I have five swords and to choose from. you're not, like, overwhelmed, really, by the different options. No, or and I, or I, I've literally never found anything like that in a treasure chest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the treasure chest so is So it's just, like, it just is what it is. Yeah, and I haven't changed my armor since, like, the last big part of... Right, even, like, sometimes I'll, I'll like... Uh, I'll finish a big question. I'll go back to the main the hub and the shop. Yeah. And it's like, oh, we don't have anything new. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. I, the only I, thing I've upgraded is my sword, I think. Right, that's the main thing that there's pretty consistent upgrades for. But there is only, like, one sword. Yeah. So that is something that I'm, I... I don't want people to think, like, oh, I hate... And I hate this. It's just a different direction than I expected. Yeah. Um, for the next main Final Fantasy game. It definitely has, game. like, way less of those... I, I kind of equate those things to more of like the RPG part of games, yeah. like Final Fantasy games, I guess. So I think they've removed a lot of sort of those things, yeah. for better or worse, you know? Yeah, I mean, that said, like I, every day I'm very motivated to keep playing this game. And, yeah. and I think the story is the story very, is very interesting. the story is very well done and they do a good job of like dropping breadcrumbs. There's always some new little thing of like, oh, I want, I want yeah. to learn more about that or what's that about or, yeah. I, or I want to uncover this mystery. I really like the next part that you're about to play mm. because there's a returning character that I was really curious about after playing the demo, which is Clive's mother, who is... Stop with the spoilers! Well, I mean, you, you're going to... It's pretty... Again, I mean, it's, she exists, obviously, from the demo, so... Okay. So yeah, so it's like those those things where they have like planted the seeds of the different yeah. characters in the early part of the game and like you kind of getting a sense of like, oh, when am I going to run into that person again? Mm -hmm. Like they seem important to the story. They seem to have like a lot of, you know, different motivations um, and could affect the story in different ways. Yeah. Like I really like that. I think those are the kind of the breadcrumbs that you're talking about and like Sort of like you, you are really motivated to learn more about like where are these characters now? What yeah. they, have they been up to, bad or good? You know. Mm -hmm. So I really, I really like that. So you'll, you'll kind of see more of that coming up. Later. Yeah. So like now that I <clears throat> have that experience, like I can understand the debates that have been happening online yeah. a little bit better. Of like, you know, I can understand why some fans don't like this direction right. and, and want a more baroque sort of game that's got all sorts of other bells and whistles and other stuff to do yeah, yeah. that you might find in a, in a previous Final Fantasy game. Mm -hmm. It definitely feels different than a Final um, Fantasy Yeah, game. I mean, for me, I, I it doesn't bother me that much. Um, I mean, the combat's very good. It's very fun. I like um, <clears throat> I, that. That thing I was talking about last week of, like, now that I have all these powers that you kind of cycle through, I was, I was like, oh, that, that sounds like a handful. It hasn't been that bad. Um it, it, it hasn't been overwhelming. Um, I think the difficulty has been fine. I haven't really found anything that's like super frustrating or, or super hard. Um, you do do the battles where you become the the icon, which is basically the big summon. Yeah. And you do those, and those are those are fun. You mm -hmm. don't do that many of those. Those are fun when you do them. Yeah, they um, make it feel special because they don't like overdo it. Yeah. Because then you you feel like it's a really significant part of the you know part of that boss fight or something like that. You feel very powerful. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. When you're the icon. Um. All the performances in the game are really good. Um, the, the character that I lost, and I was I was really sad because I really liked the performance um, Me too. of that character. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe, maybe they'll be back too. I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely. I, I'm not I, I'm I'm not at the point where I'm like, oh, this is this is game of the year material, but I'm I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. So I've um, obviously been playing the game a little bit further than you. I will say that this sort of last big part that you did kind of feels very much like, okay, now we're on the quest. Mm. You know, now it's like I, I have, like, these objectives, and the objective remains the same. You're just going to different locations to yeah. do said objective, and you're obviously meeting with conflict along the way and enemies along the way, and, and it continues to develop the story. But um, it definitely feels kind of like a Final Fantasy game in that respect in terms of narrative where like it's like you're on the you're on the quest now. Yeah. Um, 
I added one additional power the last time I played. I haven't had a chance to really like try it out yet, but it feels uh, quite different from the other three that I had. Um, so I'm excited to like see what that feels like. I do love like when you have a an enemy staggered and you can cycle through all of your yeah, you just, specials. You just do them all. And you do yeah. like crazy, and it just looks in, absolutely right. insane. Um, also, the last time I played, something really interesting happened with Torgal, best boy, oh. um, that I'm really curious about, oh, finding out more about. Nothing bad. And I did look at thisisdogdie.com and Torgal does not die, so we're good there. Um, but I was, I was really excited that like, you know, as Torgo, usually he kind of, you know, you I wasn't sure if it was just going to be like just a little support character or whatever, but it seems like they, they want to like bring um, Torgo into like the main cast okay. more and, and give him like more story as well and, and just background it and, as to like why he's the way he is. So that's really interesting and fun. Okay. I really like that. The last thing I'll <laughs> say, which is maybe something that only I thought of, is <clears throat> there's a point where... Clive gets a new outfit, which is his father's outfit. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was, I had that, and I was in this dungeon, and something in my brain was like... Castlevania? This is giving me real <laughs> Castlevania vibes. Yeah. And I, I did start to think of, like, an alternate universe where Konami did not stop making 3D Castlevania games. Yeah. I was like, I, it might have felt in some ways a bit like this. Mm. Not, not the story that they're telling, but just kind of the setting, the gameplay... Um, the feel of the game in some places, like I, it's like dark fantasy. It's very dark. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Castlevania did start to dabble in their 3D games of like, oh, well, what if you had these little summons that could come and help you that are kind of like the icons. Yes, exactly. Um, those games were very clunky. Unfortunately, they're they're not as slick to play as these. But um, yeah, that was just where my mind went. I was like, wow, this this feels this is giving me a lot of Castlevania vibes. So that leather. So that the, black leather. So the game ha has a strong commitment to black leather. To accurate sound effects of running in very tight leather pants. <laughs> Someone been, was running and they were recording this I've like holy stage. I've been playing the game with headphones. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, because I really like the the music in the game. Music is very, and very good. And there is a very prominent running sound effect. It's a little squeaky. Which is tight pants, tight leather pants. Yeah. I, I do you like Jill. I think Jill is a really good character for a final. So here's a, game. so. This is maybe a dumb question. Are they romantically together? I think that they what? like each other because there's definitely moments where like they have like we're almost gonna kiss or like our hands are like about to because touch. Because you never see them like anything closer than like 12 feet apart. There's some cutscenes. But then there was another thing where uh, in the new kind of hub, like they're sharing a room, it seems. This is like, and we're somebody, back to the, the Zelda. This is, that's exactly what I thought of. We're back at Terrytown. There was one, again, there was one bed. Hateno, they, they, seemed to be, they seemed to be cohabitating in this room. And somebody walked in and was like, oh, oh so sorry to interrupt. Yeah, they were. They were like sitting on the, they were about to like that, touch That hands. also is not super clear in the game. Well, I think it's not clear to them yet. Oh, but, there's, but they're sharing a bedroom? I mean, maybe there's only one room per period in that like tiny no, no, messed place up. Look, place looks pub. pretty big to me. We're just gonna see like in a barrel All or right. something. Well, maybe that will become. But more okay, back to beyond back to leather beyond pants? their beyond their ambiguous relationship status. Yeah. Um, I think she's a really good Final she, she Fantasy is a good, character. She is a very good character. Because sometimes it's like they go too like way on the other end, where it's just like some you know like one dimensional yeah. like. Um, you know, tough girl, like, yeah. I don't need anyone. I'm right. gonna, like, uh, more like one direction. And then they have like the other direction, which is like the Aerith that's like, I'm very sweet and gentle. Yeah. And like, but she seems to have a good mix mm -hmm. of the, like, she's a lot more complex. Yeah. And yeah. like, you know, she's had, she has her own like struggles too with her, like dealing with her power and mm -hmm. her icons. And yeah, so I, I, I really, I'm always nervous <laughs> with these games. Like, do, am I going to hate this person? Like, am I going to have the Aerith reaction to this? You really don't like Aerith. I don't at all. Um, so I'm really glad that she's not Aerith, I guess is my point. Okay. I, li I like Jill. I'm a Jill fan. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Uh, we got to attend a virtual preview for Venba, which is a game that is coming out soon that we're both uh, excited for. Oh, my gosh. This preview made me so hungry. <laughs> like, I could not stop thinking about 
like getting a dosa after <laughs> for like hours later. I'm like, I really need to go get some dosa. Um, so for people that don't know, Vemba is a really cool game that we actually saw during GDC. Right. It is a narrative game, but told through cooking. And all of the um, food is from South India. Right. Um, I think it's called like the Tamil region. Right. Um, it's like a family that immigrated to Canada. Yes, from and it, South India. And it's India. told over some period of years. Right, right. right. And it's, it's really, the story is very heartwarming. It has a lot of like elements of what it feels like to be, you know, a family that immigrates from your home country to a foreign place. Like my family did that. So I really connected to that story. And I, I the, when the, uh, the, I guess it was the producer um, was telling us about kind of what motivated the story and, and how a lot of immigrant families um, tell like their family history through food. Mm. That's exactly what my mom did with me. Like when she would cook dinner for us every night, like it would be a shared narrative about like, you know, why, why this recipe is um, significant to her and like her mom taught her how to make it, you know? So I, I can see that the story is going to really resonate with me. And I, it, it was really cool to see that kind of element of being told through food as well. There was a detail in there that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to get your take on, which was, <clears throat> so the characters are bilingual and in the game, like there's different colors of the text boxes to mm -hmm. indicate what language they're speaking, whether yeah. it's English or their native tongue. Yeah. And they were saying like, when you're playing the child who's growing up in Canada, when it's in the native tongue, it's it's more like the the words come out kind of like more slowly because yeah. they're not as well versed in that. Yeah. And I'm wondering you, about your experience about that because like I've heard you go talk, you know, Chinese to your mom downstairs. Like, yeah. How, how did that strike you as interesting? Totally, or? because like when you first when I first came to America, like my mom's number one focus was like learn English as fast as possible. Mm. I, I was five, so I was pretty young, and I was able to learn the language pretty quickly. I think it took me about six or seven months. But I think, you know, as a parent, her whole thing was like, I just want you to fit in. Right. I want you to like be okay. So at the expense of like losing your native tongue, like learn English. So it's really interesting because it did take me a while after, you know, the, the focus was like learn English, just fit in. And then, then it was like, oh wait, but don't lose the Chinese because that's important too. So um, it took me a while to get my language skills back. Um, and obviously that, that really was because I was speaking Chinese to my mom, um, you know, at home, but yeah, like sometimes I like, it's, it's a struggle for me. My vocabulary is not very good. So it's like hard to find the words. And so I can see why they did that where like the text boxes would have like pauses because he's trying to think of the word in his native language um, so he can talk to his mom because sometimes I can't think of the words either, right. you know? So it's really interesting. Yeah, I thought that I was an interesting that. little detail. Um, they were talking about like the approach to the cooking, like they didn't want it to be a cooking mama type game. Yeah. And it's kind of structured like a puzzle where you have the recipe, but like, oh, there was a splash of something on this and now I can't read the words yes. and you have to like figure it out. And when we were playing the game, we were both really surprised by that because yeah. when, we, when we sat down to play the game, no one told us like what to expect. Um, and when we opened the recipe, I was expecting to see like list of ingredients, list of instructions, yeah. but like we struggled to put together that first recipe and we failed several times. And every time you fail, it like kind of updates the recipe to what you may need to do differently. So I, I like that as well. It's like very experimental and less, less of like, you know, follow these instructions yeah. as fast as possible to get a dish. And then they were saying, you know, they themselves as the developers cooked every dish that's in the game, which I think is important yeah. research. And, um, you know, you can really get, get that sense of like personalization and like attention to detail mm -hmm. that's reflected in the recipes. I think that's what, what made us hungry. It was like, wow, this is like the real yeah. thing, not just some like fake video game version. That made me hungry. And I thought it was awesome that the sound, the, the yeah. sound director that did all the sound was basically cooking in real life and just had like a microphone. Right. Like they made their a Foley stage like in their kitchen basically. And she was just like toasting mustard seeds and as it like crackles, it was recording the yeah. sound. And the, the producer was saying like there was one recipe where she cooked, they just, they didn't do any edits. They just laid the sound over and worked perfectly. Yeah. It's amazing. Like honestly, like just incredible amount of detail and love that yeah. you can tell went into this game. And we're both super excited to play it when it comes out. Um, 
Maybe we'll try to make one of the recipes because if it's that good, like we could pr probably recreate it. Yeah. Yeah, the food looks incredible as well. <laughs> uh, a game you played while you were gone is Return to Monkey Island. Is that the full name? It is, okay. yeah. So this is the one that came out, I think, last September. And it's been on my like backlog for a long time. I'm a huge fan of the Monkey Island games. I've played through several of them in oh. the past. I like the point and click kind of games too. And it's been a while since I've played one of the Monkey Island games. Um, but yeah, since I was out on my lovely uh, cabin vacation, I basically was able to play the, the entire game, like I'm beginning to end. It was not super long and it's such a good game. Like seriously, if you are a fan of like narrative puzzle games, um, this you have to check this game out. It is so good. The story is so fun and funny. I was like legit laughing out loud at some of the ridiculous, you know, things that that was happening in the game and also just the way that the narrative, the, the writing was done. Um, the puzzles are not super hard, you know, but they feel really satisfying when you solve them. And it's really cute because how they structure the game is like, it's like a dad telling his son the story about Monkey Island and finding the secret to Monkey Island. And so like every once in a while you'll get like, you kind of, you're so you're in the story and then every once in a while you kind of get pulled out of the story and you're back on like the park bench with the dad and the kid. And the kid has like some ridiculous question like, wait a second, you didn't explain this part. And then you would kind of get brought back into the game. But it's a really good way I thought of sort of pacing the story. Um, but yeah, I really loved it and I really recommend it. So go play it. Cool. It's on Switch. And then you also played Dordone, but you got stuck on a bug. I know. Oh no. So after I well, played what did Monkey you think Island, of it uh, to that point? Dordone is so, so good. And it's everything that you said. You know, the, the art style is, it's so hard to describe it unless you've seen it. It's incredible. It. But it's absolutely incredible and something I've literally never seen before. Yeah. The just the opening scene, the opening scene is like you're sort of at this like rainy truck stop on your yes, way to Yes, that was very striking. to the village. The cur current day. Yeah, current day. Right, like the, your, the, your dreary life yeah. now. Adult Mimi yeah. is like in this like sort of dreary rainy truck stop on on the way to uh, her grandmother's house and the way that they did the water, the rain splashes, I was like, my mind could not, like, I was like, how, how? Because it, it this is the watercolor style, right? So, like, as the water, the rain water would hit the, like, the colored parts of the screen, it would, like, do that thing with watercolors where the paint would sort of, like, bleed. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what is happening here? This is so imaginative and beautiful. Um, so anyways, I, I, pl I got up to like chapter six, so I was like kind of far in, you know, like hours had gone by and, um, I was really, really loving the game so far. There's definitely something like kind of mysterious happening as well. Yeah. The family history is yeah. really interesting. I can, I'm starting to piece together, you know, maybe what is happening, um, as you like explore, uh, the house and the village and kind of regain your memories from when you spent the summer there as a kid. Um, and there's this part in the cave where you have to press the A button to climb up a wall and it doesn't work. I can't climb up the wall. So I'm like locked out of continuing the game and I've tried everything. I've, you know, re-downloaded the game. I've restarted oh, wow. my switch. I've huh. updated everything that I could update. I've I, redone the chapter several times. I never encountered anything to that degree, obviously, but I did hit a few moments that were a little bit rough where something would like skip or like the character would just like pfft, teleport like somewhere else. Oh. Look, like little things that are, were rough around the edges but didn't like really get in my way. So that's, oh, that's kind no. of a bummer to hear. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. So I brought it with me so you can look at it. Maybe if you press the button, it'll work. I, <laughs> I will press the button. User uh, error? News to come. Look forward to next week. So this game... I, so when I finish this game, they, you know, they roll credits. This game has a shockingly long credits. And oh. I, I'm kind of feeling this trend of indie games because Dave the Diver is the same way where it's an indie studio, but I think they're backed by a big, I think Nexon, this big Korean company. Oh. So I, I feel like this might be kind of an emerging trend in indies where it's like, 
indie studios making the game in the indie Style. ethos. Yeah. But they have some support and backing from a big company. Yeah. Because there was another, I forget the name, of with, with Dordon, there was another, they, they were mostly the credits. Okay. Uh, this other big company that was involved. So yeah, I remember there's like three companies that were listed in the beginning. Right. One is those indie studio for sure because yeah. it has like the, the French so, name. Yeah. That's something I'm gonna keep an eye on and just see like is this really a trend and like how are these companies involved like and hopefully they're very hands off. But maybe they give them support in like QA and, and things like You'd that hope where so. you yeah. as an indie de- indie studio and developer you might need that yeah. kind of support. Yeah, it's something I'm sort of eager to. to Look at it a little bit more closely. Yeah. That I play these two games back to back and they both have that. Oh, if I can't continue, I have to watch the ending because. You're, yeah, you were getting close ish to. I want to know what end. happened. Yeah. 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 I don't think I, should, I can start it. It's again. like what happened to me in, in Like a Dragon. You just watched the end on, on I YouTube. I have to watch it on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, so good though. It's so beautiful. It is, it is good. I'm, I'm glad you played it. Um. Let's move on to the news and start with this great big topic that we were talking about at the top. So our friends at uh, the Video Game History Foundation put out this big study. Yeah. Um, and we heard, heard rumblings from them that they were working on this and they were taking it very seriously. Um, and you should all watch our vlog of visiting the Video Game History mm-hmm. Foundation, by the way. But basically, the, the takeaway from this study is that 87% per, of all retro games are unavailable to play. Um, That's a shocking number. And this chart that they have here, kind of tracking it by decade, or it's not, it's, it's, I guess it's every five years, is interesting because it's not like, it's like, oh, it's not just the really old stuff. It's like literally everything from 2009 back. Right. Like very small amounts of those are available. It said no... No period has more than 20% uh, represented of being, like, legitimately available to play now. Yeah. And the interesting thing, too, is, like, usually you see some sort of trajectory with these kinds of graphs. Like, you would think that, you know, maybe there's more technology to, or some other way to preserve these, but that's not the case at all. It's, like, very up and down, very sporadic, like, right. what, what percentage is available to play. Right. Um the Game Boy was specifically a platform that they called out as, as having a big problem where there were almost 2,000 Game Boy games released and there are currently only 25 oh available. Oh my goodness. Um, and I said there used to be quite a few um, that were available with the virtual console, or excuse me, with the, yeah, the 3DS and Wii U virtual console, which are now gone. Right. So you can make a little bit of progress, but that can be fleeting depending on what right. these companies eventually want to do. Um, mm. it seems, you know, you kind of like want to get at like, okay, is there a solution that they're putting out there? And it seems to be, you know, their proposed solution is, is giving libraries the opportunity to digitally share games. Yeah. Um, which I think is an interesting idea. I mean, that is the purpose of libraries. If you go to a library, like you can rent a movie, you can rent a music album. Yeah. And so like, why can't there be this continuation of that mindset where this is the new medium of entertainment, um, which should be available to all people this way. Mm-hmm. But there are um, laws in place basically to prevent that. And they specifically call out the ESA. Again, the ESA once again, Ruining everything. As, as not really being supportive of this. So the ESA actually had a statement, which I'll just read. Um, the ESA says it and its member companies are committed to and actively support professional efforts to preserve video games and do so in ways that do not jeopardize future economic opportunity for their creative works. The game industry's creative and economic vitality depend on strong copyright protections. So that's a great non-answer um, from the ESA, which you know, very clearly lays out their motivation, which is... Money. We, you know, <laughs> it's up to the companies to decide. Yeah. Um, we will support and enforce approaches um, which let the companies make the most possible money off of these yeah, things. Yeah, it's money. Yeah. Right. So this study did get a lot of discussion going. Um, there was a lot of coverage, you know, when, when we first heard from Frank, he was like, yeah, I I hope that this becomes a big story because this is kind of the rallying cry of of why we exist as an organization. But some of the follow-up 
discussion was pretty interesting. Yeah. In that I think they were a little bit surprised to hit this sort of wall of apathy from certain segments of fan who are in the emulation community or who use emulation. It was like, we have emulation. Who cares? This is, this is, the, this is the solution. This is yeah. the path. And Frank sort of lays out like the reasons why that's not a mass long-term solution because a lot of people, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. A lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people have other, you know, challenges or issues. And, you know, a lot of people spoke up saying like, yeah, I work at a game studio and like, I'll bring up emulation to somebody who works in development. They're like, oh, that's just a big headache. I don't want to get into that. Right. So, um, you know, to say, to, to compare the ease of use of going to a library versus setting up an emulator is, is a big difference. Yeah. And there's always, if you think about it too, like... I know this is a debatable topic, but emulation and the idea of emulation for companies, for you know, video game companies, is that it's linked closely to piracy. Right. And I think if you go down a route where the only way to preserve is through non-legal and non-sanctioned means, it hurts you. Right. Because that means the companies will not be on board with the solution and then it becomes if it becomes the only solution then it, it it's just so difficult to gain any kind of legit legitimacy over like actual pre preservation right you now so yeah that that part is really really tough because I think a lot of people see this as like the easy solution right now because they know how to do it and it, it's easy for them to do it but right. I think long term, it's it might hurt um, the actual you know ability to to do these kinds of actual pres preservation with the blessing of these companies. Right. Like I I don't have a horse in the race anymore. Like I don't really care about the emulation debate. Yeah. I, I no. do have basically the equivalent of like Catholic guilt though when I think about something <laughs> like that, where it's like I have been I have been at Nintendo for so long that like I just have like a mental block on that yeah, topic. Sure. That I realize. Other people Don't. do not. Yeah. So that's just my own my own problem. But yeah, I think like a lot of a mm -hmm. lot of people use the shield of emulation to mask the piracy that is happening. Like people yeah. like people who are like, oh well, I just downloaded uh, Tears of the Kingdom early. I'll definitely buy it when it comes out on Switch. Wink, wink. Right. Like, like follow up. How many of those people actually did? Yeah. Uh, yeah and that's I mean, an, and that's an extreme extreme case. Right. Um, but yeah, in some cases, like. Like, like we're talking about with this study, like that is currently the only way if you wanted to experience some of these games. Yeah. That might be it. That might be it. Right. And then, so the ESA was sort of hinting at the, you know, the industry side of things, which is like, they don't have a lot of motivation to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the people who are really actively wanting this and lamenting this is unfortunately not that big. Um, they're always going to want to hold the option to put these things out, out on sale at a time that is beneficial way. for them right. versus like, oh yeah, every library in America can share, you know, every library in America can share Super Mario RPG, the original. It's like, oh, well, no, we're making a, a big new remake. We need that to be the version that people buy, people buy and get right. excited for because yeah. that needs to be the only thing. Yeah, because these business decisions are motivating you know, the, the preservation decisions right. versus it being like, let's preserve right. this like art form. So they're holding that option. But I think something that goes unsaid is like, it can sometimes, depending on the game, it can be a lot of work to go back through like the contracts, mm -hmm. whether there was some sort of a license involved. Some of yeah. these games are now from companies that have like- They've disbanded. Disbanded, or, it's like who owns yeah. the rights? We don't know. Smash had a big problem with that, that we were dealing with, where it's like yeah. some of those old characters you, that you're trying to bring back. Yeah, like you think about like the like big game companies from like the NES days, like Sunsoft. It's like who who who? What is Sunsoft now? I don't have a clue. Yeah, who owns the rights to any of their? their I don't IP? know. I'm sure somebody does. Are they? I mean, but are they? You know, Seriously? do they want to do yeah. something like this? But yeah, like and and it can become an equation of like, is it worth it to actually talk to this old license holder to mm -hmm. to like, oh well, we want to do this thing with this old game, and well, how many units are you going to sell? Like, I don't know, ten thousand. It's like. Yeah. click no one cares nobody yeah. cares so the motivation and the work to legitimately release these things isn't there so this is a real conundrum and which is why like 
my takeaway from this is like, a lot of people just don't care. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that I found to be really interesting is like, there seems to be a greater, always a greater emphasis on film preservation or even book, you know. Yeah, all these, all these other formats are in sort of a different category. It's like, oh, yeah. we, ha we have to do that. Yeah, we ha we can't let you know Gone with the Wind. Right. This be is this is lost. history. Right. This is part of human history, right. our creative history, um, a moment in time that we need to preserve and capture. I wonder why video games hasn't really transitioned in that way in people's minds. Well, I think we we sort of asked Frank that, and his his feeling was like it's just so new that nobody's mm -hmm. mind is really shifting into that. It's like everybody like. A lot of people still have the physical thing. A lot of the people who made that thing are still around. Like, yeah. But in 20 years, like we, like we talked about this, like a lot of these Nintendo developers, some of them have started to pass away. Yeah. Um, or a lot of a big generation is going to retire in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And who knows like where they're going to go? Are they yeah. going to be accessible? Um, we're close to that precipice where a lot of that history we'll starts to forever. get very yeah. into the ether. Mm -hmm. But right, it's, it's like a lot of topics. It's like, well, I, I can't think about that because I need to focus on the now. I yeah. need to worry about now. Yeah. The, yeah, the interesting thing about, you know, video games not seen as a legitimate art form or part of, like, a as legitimate as, like, film or, or um, literature or whatever is really interesting. And I think, yes, the, the newness of the industry has something to do with it. But I, I don't really, I feel like there's something else there that is a mental block for people. Yeah. Um, to really see video games in this way. It's a form of entertainment, like everything else that is considered an art form. I mean, I'd like know? to know, using their example of libraries, like, so what What was the path to getting movies in a library? The path to getting music in a library? Because obviously, you think of a library, this is for books. Yeah. But those things are there. Right. And those movies and music are, like, really, like, on top of their stuff. Yeah. So it's like... What happened for them to eventually get over that hump? Exactly. And how can it can't like can you take that same path with this, or does it need to be something totally different? Right. I don't know. I think it's definitely part of like the you have to get the industry on board to right. do it. You know, right. and film I think is a much tighter industry versus gaming. Um, yeah, you need to find like I, I think like like who are the real like decision makers in the industry who could have a strong voice in this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I go to like a Phil Spencer who does seem to really like truly care about, you know, these sorts of topics. Unfortunately, they're the platform holder. They're the newest platform holder on the blog. They don't really have like, and they can't say like, and today we're making, you know, X of it. I guess they could right. do that for like original Xbox games. It doesn't hold as much weight, I think, as, you know, if a Nintendo did it or, or some other right. company did it. That have like a more. But you kind of need history. somebody of his level to be like, I'm doing this. Get on board yeah, or deal with it. Everybody follows suit, right? Kind of because yeah. the ESA clearly is not going to do it. You need one of those people who is on the ESA board to put the foot down. Yeah, and I think if they did that, the ESA would just follow and support. Right. Um, yeah, but it is such a uh, scary discussion to have and something to think about because I think when people start to finally care, if ever. It will be too late. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of this will be I mean, be and sa sadly, that is kind of human nature, which it is, is totally like you, you, you only so start true. to care when it's a real problem. Yeah. And, and when it might be, you know, too little, too late for you to actually make an impact. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's unfortunate to think about that because, you know, you have so much of that rich history, um, especially in the sort of the time when video games were really being developed, like... You just didn't have those types of like you know ways of, that we can preserve things now. You know, like cloud storage and all that kind of stuff. So everything's very physical. Yeah, it's like yeah. literally like we joke around, but it's like literally in somebody's desk somewhere. Right. And if that's gone, it's it, it's gone forever. You know. And that's part of why my my feeling on this stuff now is like I I will never get rid of any of this stuff because it's like I <laughs> everybody become a pack rat. There's clearly just like no. No prioritization of this sort of thing. So, like, worst case scenario, it's like, well, at least I'll have this this cartridge, which I can figure out something to do with. Yeah. Worst case, uh, because I just don't have a lot of faith in it. So, yeah, 
it's a big story. I'm glad this got out. I'm, I'm glad a lot of people are talking about it. Hopefully it gets more people talking and, and you know, can bring visibility to this. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Next question. Interesting potential solution to this problem. Yes. I was, I was very excited about this. So Digital Eclipse, um, which is the studio, who actually is in the same building as, as the, we learned this, perfect. as the They're Video upstairs. Game History Foundation. Uh, they have announced a new thing called the Gold Master Series, which, so remember last year they did the Atari 50 collection. Yeah, which is very well done. Which was basically an interactive documentary mm -hmm. about Atari. Like you, you watch interviews, you learn, you see the materials, you learn about the game, and then you play the game. Um, so they have started to, their, their idea with this is we're going to do this for individual games. Mm -hmm. uh, the first game that they're doing is, is actually a game that I never played and don't have a lot of history with. Yeah. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. They kind of joke about that too. Is Karatika it? slash Karatika, whatever. Karatika. I'm not going to say it again. Yeah, Karatika. Um, but it's a game by the guy who went on to make Prince of Persia, the original right. Prince of Persia. So... It is, you know, that full length, like they're doing the work to make basically a documentary that's interactive that involves you playing the game. It includes the original game, um, prototypes that they haven't put out before, and they even did a whole new remake of the game, which is cool. Yeah. So Atari 50 is amazing. Um, like a lot of those games, I, I would not care about them otherwise, but like it's so engaging and so interesting to learn this history. Like I'm getting this day one. Yeah, for sure. This is super cool. This is such a, a smart way of teaching and preserving this kind of history. Yeah, th that this should about. be the future of these retro re releases. Yeah, for um, sure. Because you get so much more out of it. And yeah. you can bring in a bigger audience too. Yeah, exactly. And it's a it's a great way to like the interactive way that they, they sort of go about these, it makes it so interesting. Like again, if someone had said, I'm release I'm re releasing Karateka or whatever, right. I would be like, I don't Yeah, like if, don't if this is not like the next Namco Museum, like I'm snapping a pencil. Because <laughs> they, they, they just release those like on every platform. It's like, oh yeah, here's Dig Dug again. Like if, if you knew and you were there, great. If not, who cares? Deal right, with it. Right, exactly. You don't have that context right. to make it interesting or relevant to you. Come on, yeah. Namco. I'm excited about this though, because I love Prince of Persian. I, didn't, I did not know at all that there was a game before. Yeah. By the person that made right, it, so right. I'm so this is to this learn. is a really interesting trend. Yeah. Uh, next, this was a big weekend uh, surprise. This oh happened, my like, gosh! This was like late on Friday. I saw this and I was like, "What?" The Friday news dump. Major Nelson leaving Xbox. What? I can't can't believe this. After 20 incredible years, I've decided to take a step back and work on the next chapter of my career. As I take a moment and think back about all we have done together, I want to thank the millions of gamers around the world who have included me as part of their lives. Wow. Um, so he also says the official Xbox podcast is taking a break and will be back better than ever later. That was obviously a pet project for him. Yeah. Um, did you ever meet Major Nelson? I never did. I never did either. No, but I've seen him from afar. Obviously. Yeah, I mean certainly like, somebody trade shows and stuff like that. Who was one of the real like OGs of having this sort of role of yeah, being like the face, the of, face something. of a company. I remember being very skeptical when he first came on the scene. I was like, who is this guy? Yeah. What's but then the he deal? ended up being so lovable. Right. And, and so he, legit. <laughs> yeah, and he was yeah, he was very legit. Like he definitely was like truly walking the walk. Yeah. Um <clears throat> really seemed to I think when when he first came on, I remember his title being something like head of Xbox Live. That's right. So, yeah. he, but he eventually kind of transitioned into this role, kind of like, kind of seems like similar to what we were in. Exactly. Where he was making content. I know he was working with the team that was working with creators. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to be a very multifaceted team that he was leading, that he was, you know, the face of. Um, this is a big blow for them. I mean, aside from Phil. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else who is as prolific. Recognize rec like he's got like over a million Twitter followers. Like he's got a ton of people out there. I know. Um, so I wonder what he's going to do next. He says like, yeah, I've got some next big move in mind. But yeah, you think like, oh yeah, this guy's a lifer. For sure, he he's just so integral to Xbox brand and image at this point. You know, 20 years is such a long time to to be somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I I was really shocked by this. Yeah. Because I just did not think at all that he would ever leave. I, th I thought, you know, maybe he would retire, you know, at some right, point. Right. But not to do something different. Um, <laughs> but I can't wait to see what that next thing is. It, it seems if it's worth it for him to leave this, like, really 
you know, important role. It must be something that he's really passionate about, you know? Yeah, yeah, and we'll see, you know, what happens with this Xbox podcast when it comes back. Like, yeah. you know, we, we have firsthand experience of, like, when you lose the person that was leading it and super passionate, like, a lot of things can happen. I think yeah. I think Xbox is in much better shape with this, just That's in true. terms of fundamentally believing trusting in and believing a podcast? in yeah. the, 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 the thing that Nintendo did, but... Um, yeah, that's that's going to be a big change for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, lastly, more <clears throat> Microsoft stuff. We're going to briefly. Um, so this Microsoft Activision deal looks like it's going through. They, yes. they got the FTC um, thing is behind them. FTC is looking real bad in hindsight with all of this. Oh boy, the FTC. Um, but Phil Spencer again, busy weekend for Xbox, put out this tweet saying they they and PlayStation have signed the agreement to keep Call of Duty on PlayStation. And that's mm -hmm. you know, that was kind of one of the stipulations that they really had to have to, yeah, to continue to move through. this to, for this to move forward and this is um you know, I think, you know, you wonder if, if this is what they had in mind when they initially started this process, but it, but it is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. Like, at this point, I think you want to be done. Yeah. You want to move on to your, to your, to actually, you know, what it means to own the studio now. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it could have been worse. So it's one of those things where you're just like, fine. Just yeah, so I think there's a couple little dot in the I's and crossing the T's with the UK side of thing, but that, mm -hmm. I, I, from what I understand, like that's not going to stop the next step. Yeah. So I, my, my mind goes like, well, what is, what is the first Big thing change? we're going to feel yeah. as a result of exactly. this? Exactly. I, was I do. That too. I do think this year's Call of Duty. They haven't announced that. I think that this is why they have not announced it because they They're need to know for what's they, going on. Right. So I, I think that gets announced um, in Pretty the coming soon. weeks, yeah. but. I mean, is it? Good? Will we see anything before next year's call? I mean, my games coming to Game Pass. That'll mm -hmm. probably be the first thing. Yeah. Well, they, is there going to be any sort of like Xbox exclusive content beyond the base game that's available on both platforms? We don't know. Yeah. Do, do we know? This tweet is very short, but do we know like if it's in perpetuity that they have, they will have Call of Duty on PlayStation, or is it like? That's we can change question. your mind later. That's a good question. I know that the, the Nintendo deal they signed was 10 years. 10 years, yeah, So, exactly. yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure somebody out there knows the details of that. Yeah, because I wonder if it's like, well, okay, well, in five years, then... 10 years is a long time either way. 10 years is a long time either way. And then, I, but, I, yeah, if it's one of those things, it's like, well, and then two years later, we... Yeah, this is yeah. This an exclusive now. I wonder if they... I don't know. Because for a long time now... A lot of people have been saying, like, well, the wheels are coming off Call of Duty. Like, they can't just keep cranking out a game every year. But somehow they have. And, and somehow some, it continues to be still super very popular. successful. I do wonder if they're going to be like, mm, we're going every other year to make this really sustainable for us. Because, like, mm -hmm. Activision's, like, strategy has just been, like... Dump it. YOLO. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. like, we are, we are driving this thing into the ground. Right, and we're making right, as right. much money as we can in the process. Like, now they really need to manage this asset to survive and be viable because mm -hmm. that's that's mostly what they're paying for here. Yeah, exactly. They're paying for the IP. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't be surprised if they're like, we're making this a bit more sustainable for yeah. everybody. So, wow. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Big industry stuff, people. Things are happening. All right. Let's get into questions. Like we said, questions are always from our Patreon community. First is from Gartooth. Hey, Kit and Krista, in past episodes of the podcast, you've mentioned Zelda being Nintendo's second most valued IP inside the company after Mario. Can you explain the reason why the IP was held in such high regard? Was that the feeling inside Nintendo when you both started there, or was it a recent trend after the sales of Breath of the Wild? I remember the conversation on the podcast that the series was struggling to find a wider audience before Breath of the Wild, which seemed tied to the discussion about breaking the conventions of Zelda. For example, Twilight Princess was the best-selling game in the Zelda series before Breath of the Wild launched, yet there were games in other Nintendo franchises that sold better than Zelda's peak at the time, like Animal Crossing on DS and 3DS, and Donkey Kong on Super Nintendo, for example, of games that outsold Twilight Princess. What was it about Zelda that placed such a high value on it? Was it the prestige the series had with the quality of its games? This is a great question. It's a great question, yeah. Definitely the the idea and the focus of Zelda being a very important franchise um, at Nintendo was well before the success of Breath of the Wild. It was always... No, from, I think from day one. Day one. Yeah. Yeah, it's always been 
Mario Zelda as the two sort of marquee, um, you know. We're not counting. We're not counting Pokemon in this. No, yeah, we're not counting po Pokemon in this. But yeah, that's sort of the big marquee, like first party, you know, pillars were, were always Mario and Zelda. I think part of the reason is that the company kind of saw Zelda as like a good counterpart to Mario. Mario was always like that, you know, family friendly kind of play with your friends and your kids. It had a very like light, very um, easy to kind of jump into gameplay, platforming, even 3D Mario games, very kind of lighthearted. In contrast to that, you have Zelda kind of, um, or the Zelda series being very narrative driven, being a bit more, you know, like in a, the, the, the sort of the adventure game, the, the game where um, it kind of reaches a, maybe a more, like we used to call it, like the core gamer audience. So I think Nintendo always liked that their two most important franchises would reach both these audiences, and that was sort of the path forward that they saw for both these series. Yeah. I think it's one of those series that even if the sales were trailing off, it's a series a lot of people knew of and had affinity for. Like you think of like, oh, what are the big... Um, NES franchises. Well, mm -hmm. It's Mar Mario and Zelda, and maybe a couple others that are you know, maybe no longer with us, yeah. like, like, a, like a Mega Man or like a Castlevania sort sure, of thing. Sure, yeah. So it always felt like it was just the right game away from having this huge Moment. comeback. Yeah. And that's what happened, like as, as we saw. Like it just took the right game to sort of ignite yeah. this passion around... Old ignite people, or reignite, yeah. Original, yeah, reignite, yeah. right. Old, you know, old fans, new fans, everybody. Um, you know, I think it being, you know, one of those original Miyamoto franchises played a big role. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th this prestige point is important. Like, like, everybody in the media is like, oh my gosh, Legend of Zelda is like this godly series. Like, right. the, pe the influential people in the industry put this game on a pedestal. Right. The series on a pedestal, which I think helped it to maintain this status even as the sales started to taper off. And yeah, like we, we were very clear about that. Like the game was the series was in a shaky place mm -hmm. before Breath of the Wild. And now, yeah, it's 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 you, know, you can argue like oh well, Animal Crossing sold more, Mario Kart sold more. Like it's it is sealing its its place back in that pantheon. Yeah. I would say too that like the prestige point as well, it's sort of I think Nintendo's internal thoughts about why Zelda was important is that it gave them legitimacy with this audience. Like, I think there's a lot of games that you, that, that for sure, like Animal Crossing or Donkey Kong or whatever, um, those games, I think, always felt like it was... Baby games? No, not baby games. Not a baby game, Zelda? Definitely not a baby game, Zelda, but also those games, those other games that sold a lot really felt like the play was to sort of like, quote, expand the audience. And Zelda games, I feel like, has always had a place for Nintendo where it would like maintain the right. audience that they have. Like yeah, they, that's they, a need, good point. they need to keep the, the core fans happy. And to do that, they need to keep making Zelda games yeah. and they need to keep being important. Yeah. Brooke Obscura is next. Were the Nintendo World Championships ever meant to become an annual event when it returned in 2015, or was it intended to just be a one-time thing? Why was it brought back in 2017, and did the reception of that event fail to meet expectations? How involved were you in the planning of these two events? Yeah, these were interesting. Um, so I think when the 2015 event happened, it was like the anniversary, right? 25th of, anniversary. Yeah, of the, the original 1990 right. or whatever. And yeah. I think we took a question either last week or the week before about this era of like Nintendo trying to transform its E3, E3 presence beyond right. the booth. So we had a lot of these live events. We had like the Smash tournaments mm -hmm. started around here. So this yeah. was another big part of that. Of like, we will do this event at E3, but it has a lot of mass appeal that we can yeah. stream out to everybody. This is also around the time when they were doing like those Best Buy events and stuff like yeah, that too. So yeah. Nintendo was trying a lot of interesting things. And of course, having it fall on the anniversary was an important milestone. Um, the other thing was, this was around the time in 2015 where there was sort of early um, forming of the competitive team mm. at Nintendo. And, and they were sort of a spin-off of the Treehouse team. But 
the, the, I think the vision that has really not come to fruition, unfortunately, is that they wanted this sort of smaller group of people that were really ingrained in the, com- the competitive community that could host more legitimate um, Nintendo-sanctioned events and would also, of course, work with the existing events um, to do more things. That has not really gone very well um, because they, they continue to run into so many issues, as we've talked about before, with like contracts and with the way that Nintendo wants to control these certain events. But the, the Nintendo World Championships was sort of like part of that team starting up and, and um, wanting to create more like Nintendo official um, competitive events in the Nintendo way. I liked the 2015 event. Enough time had passed where it felt like, oh, this cool thing yeah. that might have been forgotten to history is coming back. I remember we actually tracked down some of the original we players did. Yeah. and did a lot of work with them and invited them out. They so were that, so, so much fun to meet yeah, them. Yeah, so, so it, cool it to have felt them like there. there was this passing of the torch. Mm-hmm. Um, they did come up with this great idea of having people play those Mario Maker levels. I think that was the crown. Unseen, sight unseen for the first right. time. Like, this will test if you're actually good versus, like, have you just practiced, practice, practice. Exactly. And I think that was, like, the magic of, like, one, one part of the magic of um, Nintendo hosting an event like this is that they do bring this, like, unique factor to it than other competitive events or, like, other speedrunning events. And that Mario Maker addition was such a brilliant move. Yeah. Um, it was really awesome to see that. The 2017 event, I was not a fan of, unfortunately. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I don't think you can do this in that interval. You need more time to pass, I feel. Yeah, to a make weird it, time. To make like it feel in, later, big and important. Yeah, yeah the, like the timing. It was like, why are we doing this now? I don't mm-hmm. know. I know. I know this one was on broadcast TV. I think maybe yeah. they have been pursuing some sort of broadcast aspirations of like, oh, yes. this is our chance to go super mainstream. Yeah. Um, Remember, this was a more global event as well. There was a lot of Japanese media that were included. Like, Fuji TV was there at this one, I believe. And it was like more of like a global yeah. play. I think but they still. I don't think they had as, they, they just didn't have as good a hook as the Mario Maker levels. Sure. I think they revisited that actually. It was like, could have come up with something a bit more fresh. And I remember like working on it, it was, it was like such a sprint. It was like, we have no time to put this together. Yeah, yeah, that was really hard. And it, it was definitely harder to get like people to care about this one, I think, because it just didn't yeah. feel like special. It didn't yeah, I was like, fresh. oh, you just, you just did that. Yeah. You're doing exactly. it again? Oh, but what? But like for what purpose, right? right? Yeah. Linnell is next. Hey, Kit and Krista, what are your views for this PAL World game? Remember oh. PAL World? Yeah, the Pokemon clone? With guns, I'm not sold on it. Naturally, I will always love my turn-based Pokemon world until they decide to experiment with that, and I love the franchise in general. I feel like the developers, or whoever, try to make these Pokemon clones a little bit less vague about it, others more blatantly about it, and they always drop the ball from my perspective. Pokemon is a hard video game to duplicate. Maybe instead of trying to copy most of the formula and charm of Pokemon, they should try to create something that's as charming but different and appealing that really captures that fan base that they're trying to sell their product to. Thank you all for hearing me out. Much love. Be blessed. Yeah. This one, we had both a very visceral reaction to this when we saw the announcement of Disgust because we were like, why is it a Pokemon clone with guns? My hot take on this is this game is never seeing the light of day. They're going to get we're, we're never, oblivion. We are never hearing from this game again. Do you remember They're a few years ago the there was people. another game that had this exact same reaction, that Dokev v Dokev? Yes, that one. It was like, oh my god, it. this is the new Pokemon. This is eating Pokemon's lunch. Have we, have we heard from that game since? No. That game, I mean, in that, ca- in that game's case, that looked like legitimately the most ambitious game ever made. So yeah. I think they had a different reason right, for right. not being able to do it. In this case, like, I do think there are probably some behind the scenes, like... <laughs> They, they got a cease and desist yeah. coming their way, I, I think. think. There's something yeah. happening. Yeah, but I think everybody that saw it had the same visceral reaction yeah. of like, why are you copying it blatantly like that? But I agree that that's not the right approach. This is Jeff Keeley's trolling. Yeah, Nintendo, you don't have anything for my show. I guess I got to put this in. Where's the Mario Club? <laughs> Mario with a gun. Everybody has a gun. <laughs> he's too busy kissing. Oh, he's kissing. He's got that's the kissing right. booth. He's got a kissing booth. MarkyMan64 asks, I like collecting achievements in games that I play. It's not my main motivation for playing a game, but I do enjoy the challenge. It's a feature I feel Nintendo misses out on. I wonder if you know why. 
Is it another example of Nintendo not caring what the competition are doing, or was there ever another re reason that you've heard? I do note that they're dipping their feet into it with NSO's challenges and wonder if this is something they consider for next gen. Ah, uh, the achievements. This, mm. so, so we talked uh, a number of times about how at Nintendo people did not like it when you suggested an idea based on the success that another company had with Correct. it. Correct. I saw somebody get so eviscerated in a meeting by saying like, yeah, I really like those Xbox achievements. Like, we should just do those. Like, this person got so, like, whoosh, <laughs> ripped to pieces because it's like, we would never just... Emulate yeah, another it's like, company. We would find our own unique yeah. way, the Nintendo way, that would put the smile on the faces with the surprise and delight. surprise and delight the fans, and that's right. not copying like, this was else. This was actually my first experience of seeing that in action of, like, how strong the reaction against it yeah. could be. Yeah, that's true. Now, though, I mean, th we should acknowledge like there was like real excitement around achievements on the mm -hmm. Xbox 360, yeah. and a little bit once um, PlayStation brought out trophies. Sorry, Greg Miller. Um, I feel like this is kind of a. I don't know how many people are as invested in this now. Right, right. I don't. I definitely feel like a sense of joy and pride when I get an achievement, but it's not like I would not play the game without it. It's right. not so, and, and Marky Man 64 says the same thing. It's not integral to your, you know, gameplay experience, but it's a, it's a nice to have, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it kind of falls into, I think, a lot of other sort of nice to haves on Nintendo stuff where they're like, yeah, you know, this could be kind of fun, but we got so much other stuff that we're dealing with that we're not going to be focused on this. The other thing is that Nintendo definitely has a focus on, like, everybody can enjoy our games. Like, you don't have to be, yeah, you like... you don't have to 100% it. You know, the hardcore gamer that has, you know, 100% of a game or speed run this, like, Mario game a million times to enjoy this. Like, anybody can do it. So I think achievements kind of go against yeah. that a little bit where you are rewarding somebody for being like, quote unquote, like good at something. In the Xbox 360 era, did you ever buy a game just to get achievements? Absolutely, yes. Do you remember the game? I don't remember. Avatar was the, the Avatar oh. game. The King Kong game, that was like a launch game. Th these were some of the oh. ones that were just like the easiest thousand gamer points oh, that yeah. you could ever get. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was working at Namco at the time and the group I was with was very competitive about this. So you just had to like be Yeah, I do remember some nights I was like frantically checking the score. Like, oh, oh, so I can't beat it nonetheless. He's, he's, he passed me. Now I need to do this dumb thing to get know, these achievements. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad. Those were fun, but I'm kind of glad those times have passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, I do love the, I do like the PlayStation trophies too. Yeah. Like I did the pet Torgal trophy like immediately. Okay. Because it was cute. I, I can't I be bothered. I can't be bothered with those. I'm into Again, it. Again, sorry, Greg Miller. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Nathan's next. A few years ago, Nintendo experimented with the idea of doing limited releases of games, specifically Mario 3D All Stars and the translated port of the original Fire Emblem. Oh yeah, that. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Both were sold for a fixed period of time before they stopped producing physical versions and pulled the entries from the eShop. The manufactured scarcity seemingly boosted sales of the games, and despite fears that these games would be hard to find after the expiration date, it seems they printed enough physical copies that anyone who wants to buy a copy can find one for a semi-reasonable price. At the time, many were concerned this practice would become a trend, but Nintendo hasn't tried to do this with any games since then. Do you think Nintendo thought this promotion was successful by whatever sales metric Nintendo uses for this sort of thing? Do you think they might try another limited release like this in the future, or do you think the public outcry discouraged them from attempting the same kind of promotion? I was always so confused by these promotions. And no we, one could ever... We, we asked really specifically. Multiple times, multiple, multiple people. Times to Why are we doing this? A lot of different people, like at NOA, at NCL. Who should have the... People who should have the answer. No one had the answer. No one could give us a good answer. Because I was I was working on Super Mario 3D All-Stars. And I understood that it was, like, this anniversary thing. And it was, like, supposed to be part of that whole, like, anniversary message. And, you know, that, that was what we were saying from a PR standpoint as to, like, the explanation of why this was limited. But it just seemed so stupid. And so, yeah, we asked so many people and nobody gave us a straight answer. The answer was like nonsense. 
I think somebody had to be like truly into like this is the spirit of the anniversary. The anniversary ends on X date. I think that's because this what thing it was. like you would think Super Mario Three D World could be a huge seller during at, the like, holidays. Every holiday for the many years that the yeah. Switch continues to exist. Exactly. What a great game to give anybody any time. But that was not communicated to anybody, or yeah. different people had different interpretations. I don't know. Never got a good a good yeah. or clear answer we on did, this. I mean, the anniversary was the only thing that we got as kind of an answer, but once we like went one step further as to yeah. like asking why, it just like, became it, it, gibberish. It was nothing. There yeah. was no good reason. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. <laughs> That's our answer. <laughs> I don't. I don't think they were they were galaxy braining this thing though. Yeah. Please, I, please never do this again. I think that they please were don't. totally like they like lock themselves into something and they yeah. were digging their or feet somebody in. like high up was like we're doing this. Don't question me about it. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Like they, yeah. they've, and they've dug their feet into it, and now they are too prideful right. to admit go that back it was a the bad other idea. way. Yeah. So that that's the reason yeah. why, and that's why we couldn't get an answer. But right. I think it's absolutely bonkers nonsense. <laughs> Don't do that. It's dumb. Last question is from Zvroid. Hello, Kit and Krista. From your time working at Nintendo, you must often have had to communicate with people on Nintendo's behalf for any number of reasons. Over the years, did you ever get a sense of what these various parties, such as developers, publishers, or media, felt about their business dealings with Nintendo? What was something good, which was generally appreciated when working with them, and what was a common gripe or source of consternation when working with them? I do think developers all said that Nintendo Switch was very easy to develop for. Right. And we always got like this huge sigh of relief all the In time. In contrast to Wii U. To the Wii U. Yeah. yeah. And people were saying like, oh my gosh, when we got the dev kit for Switch. It was like, we were all just like jumping for joy because it was so easy and fun to develop for it. And I think that makes a big difference as to why the Switch life cycle has been so strong as well. Because you do have so much great, you know, third party um, indie, indie developer support because the system is easy. Um Gripes, from a media standpoint, I think Nintendo embargoes were pretty complicated. There was a lot of kind of, the embargoes sometimes got so long that they would be really confusing and it's scary because as a person, a journalist, you don't want to break the embargo, but sometimes you just don't understand it, you know? Um, so that was always one that we would fight against pretty actively. Like, hey, can we like reword this a different way or can we trim this down a little bit so we don't confuse people and they don't accidentally break the embargo because they're just so confused. Um, that was always one that we we looked closely at when we got the rollout schedules and tried to make it as easy to understand as possible. Sometimes I would have a hard time understanding them myself. So, Someone once said to me, um, Nintendo is the most type A video game company you could <laughs> yeah. ever imagine, which is very true. It's very true. Like, they definitely know... Like they are the big dog in most business relationships, mm -hmm. and they act like it, which is yeah. the, it's their prerogative. I sometimes I did feel bad for some of these companies that we were working with because it's they would tell you like, oh, this is the timeline we have to follow these dates, or, or we're in big trouble. And Nintendo's like, I don't care, we're not ready. Yeah, deal Either with it. You Make deal it, with it, or you we we pull. Make it work. Yeah. yeah. And there were a lot of situations like that, which yeah. were tough because yeah. I, and a lot of times we, like we were shooting ourselves in the foot too being being the big dog so yeah. <laughs> who's the yeah. joke on who's the joke on yeah. exactly yeah yeah um, definitely. yeah that that was my big big takeaway yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i mean everybody like was in the same sort of awe of like oh my gosh we're working with nintendo like whether you're making a game that's on nintendo or you're just like some random business partner everybody right. was like people would just bend everybody over signed back. up for it everybody would bend over backwards yes please to do whatever yeah. you ask them to do and sometimes i felt bad making the ridiculous yeah. request yeah. but i was only the messenger and i i tried to like you know be as helpful as possible yeah. to partners yeah. but um the response that we we'd always get from partners was like okay we'll do it yeah <laughs> I don't know if that's teaching bad habits, though. Probably is. But hey, until they're not the big dogs, they won't have to deal with that. So there you go. That is all the questions. Right. Shall we shout out some of our wonderful, beautiful Patreon superstars? We shall. Okay. Aaron Hash. Ben Eichor. Maru Mayhem. Eigenverse. Kiss My Flapjack. Mike Chin. Mr. Rogers. Roy Eschke. Switching it up, underscore. Safazon. The Shark Among Men. VGM Life. Link, the hero of winds. Angela Bycroft and her pink molly. Turbocharge Nerd. Thomas O'Rourke. Kyle LaBeouf. Christopher Lara. Simon. Frederick Ulf Conradson. Andrew Juhas. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs>
Okay. Our One Up Club graduation service, here we go. A. Ron Burgundy. Adam and Ainsley. Ajan Malari. Ali Alejandro. Alexandra Pratt. Astro Dead. Bag Moo Rising. Ben G. B. Book of Dano. Brad SF56. Brooke Obscura. Brookie Kazooie. Bruce Stash. Chelly Squirrel. Christopher Lay. Captain Alex. Crim Cat. C. Roper 17. Daniel Cold. Daniel Phillips. Dogson. Dolce. Dino Punch. Elite Peach. Elix 780. Aspars 50. Farpree 69. Fairbank. Fernie and Jess Forever. Fox Deploy. Fred Rossi. Garrett Hullfish. Garth the Wolf. Gartooth. G Sen 101. Ian Shea. Isri Iris Marin. Jay Randa. Jabroni Jones. JBJ. Jeffrey Hernandez. Jerry 92602. Jesse Hernandez. John Responte. Jonathan Rowe. Jordan Collette. Jordan Hemmerly. Joseph DeHayes. Joshua Clements. Juji Fruit. Jess Camtro. Justin Leminger. Cairo Trigger. Kawa2796. Keith Kwong. Kelpshake. Kevin Delane. Kilo Kibo. Chris Yu. Christopia Party With Me. Kyle Gamer Barry Rookie. Kyle Kretzer. Kyler Nelson. Linnell Stickman. Lennis Sullivan. Lit. Mad Dog 5981. Marky Man 64. Mecha Dragon 101. Megan. Michael Cravens. Michael Rios. Mikey. Moat Demania. Mr. Andy Pond. Mr. Beans and Dip. MSM Poke Gamer. My Train. Nasir. Nathan Burkhart. Nick E. Ninja Eleven. Panda Buns. Pangy. Paul C. Pace. Paul Gale Network. Prime Factor. Prince Charmless. Raver. Rain Tech. Renee Rivers. Ryoth One. RJ Kern. Rob Osborne. Rocks. Rianetta. Sam Newland. Sharif Jackson. Shinryu. Slowbro. Shrews. Silly Ferret. SJ Sharky 777. Spicy Munchkin. Steel's Trone. Tales of Link. Tech Magic. Terra Storm. Thomas Alvarez. Three Rivers. Topher Schmofer. Travis Torline. Tugs Puppy Bear. Tusku. Tyler Geis. Fessfess. Video Game Stupid. Virid Ian. Virtual Bot. Weeb Kingdom. Wicked Davy. Will Johnson. Zudiverf. Zelgarod. Zapati. And Zroid. All right. Whew. There's one that's rocketing up my list of most fun to say. Just mm -hmm. Pangy. Pangy. <laughs> Pangy. I like Pangy. I do like Pangy. I still like Bookum Dano. <laughs> <laughs> and Topher Schmover. <laughs> There's a lot of them. <laughs> good ones. There's some good ones. Um, all right. Well, if you want us to read your name, don't forget to subscribe to us on patreon.com slash Kit and Krista. Lots of other benefits there as well, including our bonus Q&A that we do every week. Check with them the out. Juicy, juicy questions. If you are watching this podcast on video, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, Kit and Krista channel. It's where you're watching this right now. You can leave us a comment and also give this video a thumbs up. If you're listening on an audio service, you can also subscribe, uh, give us a five-star rating and also a written review, please. Yes. And the socials. We are on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and Threads. Still on Threads. Still on Threads. Threads is not gone down in flames just yet, so we're still there. Good stuff. Um, another wonderful podcast in the books the ac has been working regular are, performance on this podcast we are not sweaty a plus whoa <laughs> regular performance. okay uh a minus a minus, a minus. oh a minus. oh a minus all right we'll talk to you guys later bye, bye.